Hello and welcome to our webinar. Something totally different today, y'all. You get to see us. So uh, we're glad you're here. Um, I'm James Van. This is Jim Beck. And uh, we're going to be leading today uh, a conversation regarding maximizing recovery when the chips are down. So I actually bumped into somebody this week and they said, wait a minute, are the chips up or are the chips down? They're like, like, I'm all in. I want to be chips all in. I said, hey, either way, right? Either when they're down or they're up. Either way, we're all in. So we hope you will enjoy this today. Um, we're going to um, be going through a little bit of the homework with you today in the sense of remember, if you have questions, you may submit those a couple of different ways. Uh, they can either use the go to uh, go to meeting um, control panel. You can do it that way or you can send them to us uh, by email at uh, webinar at And also you should have a handout that you receive by email or you can go on the control panel for a uh, go to meeting uh, and look on there under the handout. So that's just a, um, a copy of the slide presentation. You'll also receive that. Uh, following our, our presentation today. So, Jim, you ready? I'm ready. All right, here we go. So, a little bit of hand, uh, uh, homework just for the very beginning, y'all. Um, this is our last webinar for uh, the year, and then we will start back uh, January 21st, 21. So, 012121. Put that on your calendar. If you've got a topic you want us to cover, let us know and we'll get that started. And also, some of you already know this because you've reached out to us. We have started a podcast. And we're sort of walking through how civil litigation works for our clients. Uh, so we hope you'll listen to that. It's about 30 minutes each, and uh, hope we've gotten some good response back. So hopefully it's helpful to you. All right, with that, let's get started. So we're going to uh, advance forward here. Uh, if I can get to the slides, hopefully. There we go. Hopefully that's going to work. Okay. Um, so. Uh, in our webinar today, we're going to be talking about strategies uh, when your customer files for bankruptcy. Uh, what do you do when there's a defunct company? What is that? How does that work? You know, uh, and then when your debtor is evasive, what are your options? So those are some of the topics we're going to talk about. But first and foremost, we're going to be talking about strategies when your customer files bankruptcy. Um, so this is the advice we have for you, right? So you don't what you don't want to do is to not participate, right? You don't want to um, say, you know, my, my customer filed bankruptcy and I'm, I'm just not going to follow the bankruptcy rules. I'm just going to stay out because I'm not getting anything anyway. We've heard that a bunch. It really depends on what you're owed, how much you're owed, uh, what your relationship is with the, with the customer, your client. So, for example, are you a secured creditor? It makes a huge difference, right? If you're a secured creditor, you definitely want to participate in the bankruptcy. If um, you have just recently sold them uh, materials or supplies, you definitely, I would suggest, want to participate. If you have lien rights or bond rights, definitely want to participate. Um, knowing the rules and then following those rules really are, is important, right? Using the rules to your advantage where possible. I can tell you, if you don't participate, to, uh, if you don't participate in bankruptcy, you're going to lose, right? And you may not get 100% back anyway. Uh, we've had clients who receive notice to file proof of claims and then don't, right? And then they've got to figure out later on um, if there is some uh, disbursement from the bankruptcy court, why they're not getting anything. Um, so again, knowing the rules and following those is a huge, huge plus uh, in helping yourself in bankruptcy court. We would suggest call us, or if you have another attorney that you use, call them, but, but not participating in the bankruptcy. I guarantee you, you're not going to win. Um, and again, if you're a secured creditor, you have a lot of rights um, to go after the property. That's the security if the if the debtor, the company or individual that filed bankruptcy is the, the person who's giving you that collateral. Uh, absolutely, you need to go after it and protect it and try to get that out of the bankruptcy so that you can then uh, hopefully become a little bit more whole in whatever loss you had. So what are some strategies that you need to be thinking about uh, when your customer does file, right? If you've got goods in transit or uh, if they're on order, once you learn of the customer bankruptcy, you need to try your best to stop the transit or the shipment of those goods um, to your customer, right? If they are, you know, I've, I've seen folks go out and literally stop the truck before it gets to the, the work site, to the project. Nothing wrong with that, right? Th those have not been paid for and they're not in the customers. So if you can stop either the manufacturing of them, if they're especially manufactured goods, that certainly is going to help you. 
or if for some reason the the goods are in transit if you can direct those and have those turned around and brought back to say your your uh, warehouse or your office somehow or another put you in a lot better spot um also another thing that you could do is ask for what's called uh, adequate assurance and this is if you're supplying materials or any kind of goods you basically are saying to them hey look i'm not sure that you had the ability to pay me and i want you to confirm whether you can pay us or not that's covered in the ucc and also the bankruptcy code now you think well why would i even ask that question because if they filed bankruptcy why they're not going to pay me anyway well, maybe, maybe not. Depends on what type of a um, relationship you have with them. I know a lot of our customers are, a lot of our clients are um, necessary vendors to some of their customers. And if you are, you are in a great, great spot and you want to take advantage of that. Because if you are a critical vendor, you could get preferential treatment in the bankruptcy court uh, as a supplier or vendor to make sure that you get paid going forward. Now, the stuff that's owed back before they file bankruptcy may be in question. And maybe a little bit, you may have to figure out how to get that, but there are times, there's some ways you can and there's other ways you can't. But those are two good ways to, to try and protect yourself when your customer does file for bankruptcy. And the other thing I would suggest doing is trying to um, use reclamation rights, right? That's, you can use that reclamation rights both in the UCC and the bankruptcy code. And the one thing that we try to tell our clients is you gotta act quickly on that, right? If there's a, re a written reclamation uh, right, you've gotta demand that the materials or the payment for that be sent back to you, and actually have the material sent back to you within 45 days after the customer receives the goods or within 20 days if the bankruptcy filing, if the filing occurred within the last 45 day period. The goods must still be in the possession of the customer when, you, when that happens. So reclamation rights is a great protection and a lot of times if you do that on in time what happens is you may wind up negotiating with the bankruptcy court to have some kind of a preferential payment for those goods again just another idea that that might help you so um the other thing is a 20-day administrative claim so you might be entitled to that if there has been a uh, materials received by your customer within 20 days before they file bankruptcy. So again, let's say it's between one and 19 days or 20 days before uh, they file bankruptcy, they receive the materials. You can actually ask for an administrative claim. This applies if the customer bought the goods in the ordinary course, uh, and you also can use a proof of claim for uh, some strategies to help yourself. That is where you file a written proof of claim to um, the, in the bankruptcy court. Jim, are you going to say something? I was going to ask James, what is the benefit of an administrative claim? Great question. So what's the what's the purpose of the administrative? What is, how, how does it help you? If you have an administrative claim, you have a higher priority of payment, right? So if you are unsecured, you're pretty much at the bottom of the barrel of getting payment. If you are a secured creditor, you, you're higher up. If you're administrative claim, you're first up, right? When the lawyers get paid, the CPAs get paid, administrative claims are paid in the same way. So that's a great question, a good priority. Right, that's where you want to be is, is getting a higher priority of payment. So hopefully that makes sense. Good question, Jim. So um, defunct companies, Jim is going to walk us through that. What, what are defunct companies and how does that work? So Jim, leave us off in that. All right, thanks, James, and I appreciate all y'all uh, logging into the webinar today. I'm excited to be back with Van Attorneys um, after a year being gone. Um, so let's jump right in. Um, defunct companies. What we mean by that? Um, is a couple things. It can be a LLC or a corporation that is dissolved, which means they've filed papers with the Secretary of State to um, eliminate their corporate charter. They don't. They want. They no longer exist. Uh, it could also mean a company that exists but it's not being used. It's abandoned or it's inactive. Um, it could be a company that's out of business, uh, and it could just be a company with no assets. Um, so when we're going over sort of strategies here, we're talking about all these types of entities uh, that for whatever reason, we're just going to categorize them all as defunct. Uh, and there's basically four things we're going to talk about. One, do we have a personal guarantor? Two, is there any way we can get 
officer liability. So we don't have a guarantee, but we want to go after an officer because really there's nothing else to go after. Um, maybe we can get an individual on the hook in some way. Uh, successor entities, uh, and I'll explain what that is. Uh, and then fraudulent conveyance of assets is another uh, technique. We're going to each going to go through each one of those individually so that we can kind of get an idea. Um, so ideally, a corporate debt is going to be guaranteed by a personal guarantor. Uh, obviously, we do not live in a world of ideals, um, and more often than not, if we're chasing a defund company, it's because we don't have a guarantor. Um, but to get a guarantee, uh, we're going to need something in writing, uh, got to be in return for consideration, and, and that can that can generally just be, uh, the consideration can be agreeing to extend credit to the corporation. What you want to do is get a guarantee at the outset of the credit relationship. Um, but today we're talking about what if we don't have a guarantor, because that's when it starts to get a little tricky. Uh, so step one, uh, the strategy one is we're going to talk about when we are trying to get officer liability, right? So um, an officer may be liable for corporate debts, but only in very rare specific situations. Uh, the first situation is probably the more common, uh, and that is when a debt is incurred while the corporation or the LLC is suspended. So that typically occurs in a situation where the corporation or the LLC has not filed their annual reports or they have not paid their taxes. And the state has basically suspended their charter, meaning for whatever period of time they're suspended, they, the corporation no longer exists. So when the debt is incurred during that period of suspension and the officer knows about it, we can uh, attribute that debt to the individual uh, who is an officer of the company. Uh, the second situation is when the debt arises from an officer's fraud. So an officer of a corporation or an LLC cannot avoid uh, liability saying, oh, it's the corporation's debt, when his or her fraud is what uh, caused the debt to be incurred. Um, that's not quite as common. Uh, one, fraud is difficult to establish, and two, uh, it, it's just not a common occurrence in comparison to incurring a debt while your while you're charter is suspended. Uh, another strategy is to pursue a successor entity. Uh, and the, a successor entity means an entity that is basically continuing on the business of the defunct corporation. Uh, and that can really happen in probably two situations uh, that are um, most common would be a merger where um, the company that's now defunct had merged into another entity and has become part of that different or new entity. Sometimes they'll create a new entity to merge into. Um, and so what's going to be important in this situation is uh, what the uh, merger documents say about pre-existing liabilities, uh, whether um, the new entity is basically just carrying on the business of the old. Uh, and so there's going to be a lot of factors that the court is going to have to consider uh, to determine that that new entity is liable. Um, the other one's a little cleaner where it's not a merger, but it's what's called a mere continuation. So think of an example where we've got a company uh, called, let's just call it one, two, three um, contracting. Okay. That company um, is owned by a particular person. That company is defunct. That person who runs that business starts a new company called four, five, six contracting. They've got the same customers. They've got the same business model. They've got the same owners and they're even using the same assets. Well, the court's going to say that's really not a new entity. That's a mere continuation of the entity that's now defunct. And that creditor can then pursue recovery against uh, that that new entity. Well, a lot of times, Jim, they use the same office, same mailing address, same phone numbers. It's amazing how that works. Happens all the time. Um, 
The other situation is where we've got something that we can consider a fraudulent conveyance. Uh, and it's, it's kind of similar to the mere continuation argument, um, but it's uh, set out in a statute that says um, a creditor can avoid a transfer of property. So think of it as the defunct corporation has transferred their assets to another person or another entity. Um, so that transfer can be avoided by the creditor so that that creditor can then get those assets um, if that transfer was done with the intent to hinder, delay, or defraud a creditor. There was no reasonably equivalent value for the transfer of assets and the debtor becomes insolvent. Um, so basically the old company basically gives all the assets to the new company. The old company can't pay anybody. Um, didn't get anything in return. That's a fraudulent conveyance and we're going after that new engine. Um, and I've seen this happen actually recently where this company um, even used the same website. They just changed the name of the company on the website. Um, and they've, I think they've opened two or three other ones by now, um, but it's always it's identical companies. So Jim, we got a question just a minute ago when the company has been suspended, right? When the company uh, by the Secretary of State has been, the corporate chart has been suspended. Uh, the question is, is the company required to tell us that they've been suspended? No, no. Um, usually what happens is um, it's, the, it's discovered by the creditor later. Um, a lot of times we'll find out that from some period of time, there was some other period of time it was suspended. Honestly, 90% of the time, the uh, company has been suspended and never gets uh, re, um, what's it, uh, reissued, reauthorized. Um, so it, it's actually a determination we make later and say, look, they were suspended the whole time. Um, what we use as knowledge for the officer when we're making these arguments is, it shows that the Secretary of State sent out a notice to the company at their address, they're still at that address, and we argue that that's knowledge. So even, even uh, the owners of the company may not technically know that they've been suspended, but we're gonna at least make the argument they knew or should have known. And by public record, they've been, they've been notified, they've been told, they just ignore it. Yeah, they generally they ignore it. It's, it's usually from not filing annual reports. A lot of companies will form, the people who are running them have no idea that they've got to file an annual report every year either they forget about it and so that's the situation where we will pursue an individual um, because of, because they didn't do what they're supposed to do um, so the next thing we're going to talk about uh, are evasive debtors um, and what can we do when we either can't locate the debtor the debtor has no assets uh, that could be hiding assets, that could be moving assets around, um, maybe another property, uh, maybe send it to a friend's uh, location because they know we're coming after it. Or it could be just avoiding or ignoring obligations. Are they ignoring invoices and payment demands? Are they avoiding service of, of papers? Uh, or are they ignoring court orders? And there's plenty that we can do in all these situations. So before and during litigation, um, there's two main things that we can do to really protect the creditor's ability to recover. Um, the first one is what's called a prejudgment attachment. Uh, and it's, again, this is not something that we're often able to do, but there are occasions when we can. Um, so there are several situations when we're entitled to seek a prejudgment attachment. Um, so first, uh, if there's a non-resident or foreign corporation, um, we're able to uh, basically attach any assets that are in the state. Second, if the corporation's officers can't be found in the state, um, we can do it. If there is a resident who is departing the state, we can attached to his assets. Um, and, and then finally, there's a resident, this, this, on this last one, it can be a corporation or an individual resident who's removing, hiding, or disposing of property. 
we can attach um, those assets. So what, what happens is we file a lawsuit to collect money, basically. Um, we file a motion for attachment with an affidavit setting forth the required facts of why we're entitled to the attachment. And when the motion is granted, the attachment goes to the sheriff, just like a writ of execution would go post-judgment. And that sheriff then is uh, told to seize those assets during the pendency of this lawsuit. Uh, and basically the assets are within the court's uh, possession until that judgment is granted. We then use those assets to satisfy the judgment. Uh, the second is claim and delivery. And this one uh, requires the creditor to have a security interest. Um, so again, we're filing a lawsuit for collection, uh, but there's a security interest. So we file an action for claim and delivery uh, saying the client has security interest in this property. Uh, we post a bond uh, and then the court then orders that property to be turned over. Um, it's very much like a re repossession process, except instead of just a self-help repossession, um, we're having the court help us do it. Uh, and then another thing we can do, a uh, contempt order. And what, why that's in here is when we're talking about debtors who ignore court orders, the remedy is contempt. And when there's a contempt order, any officer of the law of this state can arrest that debtor, put them in jail till they're in compliance. And what it really does is makes them comply. Um, and it's amazing, Jim, the times we've gotten contempt orders signed and served. Um, sometimes it happens immediately after that. And a lot of times it's like, it'll be months, right? Um, and it's amazing to me. So what day is it generally, do we usually get the phone call that someone's locked up? It's always a Friday. Oh, it's always. Friday. Yeah. And they want to get out of jail that day. And I mean, our heart hurts, right? I mean, sometimes it's, you either hear some really sad stories, but it's really out of our hands because they've ignored what the court told them to do. And most judges want you to follow what the court says, right? Um, so it's, it is a great way to get someone's attention. Uh, and it's, yeah, that's not our goal. Our goal is to get money early, but if they're just ignoring it, it's a great way to get their attention. And this happens most often with a supplemental examination because debtors appear maybe half the time. We get an order for contempt. They, uh, once they're arrested, they either, it's probably 50-50, they're either gonna pay because they're in jail, how, how can I get out of here, you can pay it, or they'll produce the documents and answer questions. Um, so, you know, we hate arresting people, it feels terrible, but also it's gotten clients paid before. Um, so you know, it's not our fault, they didn't comply, so can't feel too guilty. There's a court order. So um, post-judgment, there's some things the sheriff can do where, you know, it's out of our hands. So, you know, that's great when the sheriff can be proactive and do things. So one thing the sheriff can do is a bank levy. Um, it's not something that happens a lot. And there's a few reasons for that. One, the sheriff is only going to levy a bank account when he knows where the bank is, what bank it is. Uh, Sheriff will go to that bank and do a levy. Um, the other thing a sheriff can do uh, for a for a corporate debtor um, is request information regarding the shares of stock of the corporation. Uh, basically, who owns them, how many shares, where are they, um, and those shares can be seized and sold to satisfy the judgment. Now, one of the other reasons that a lot of this doesn't happen often, uh, sheriffs are pretty overwhelmed, especially now. Um, and um, it's just a lot of them are going through the motions. It's a tough job. Um, and collecting debts is, is not always their favorite thing to do. It's, it's not a comfortable thing. Um, but in the, situ in the right situation, we'll we'll make sure that they're aware that these are things we want them to do. Um, again, we can direct them to do these things. And then um, a lot of times, maybe that'll spur a payment at the very least. Um, and that's what I was going to say. Yes, uh, I was going to say, and it's really, you know, the, the great, a great point, Jim, the deputies are working really hard. 
Uh, most of the deputies across the state are doing that. Occasionally, you find someone who doesn't really care, but that's the I think that's the exception. But I think what's really cool is when we give them. Some of the deputies don't know some of the tools that the statutes allow them to do, and we a lot of times we are educating deputies to say, "Hey, look, do this right with the stock certificates, or go in and ask them who owes, owns who owes the money to the debtor, right? If there's somebody a company that owes money to the debtor company or an individual." We can then go get money out of their pockets, right? And when you when you educate and then give them another tool, and they get excited, which that's is fun. Of, yeah, definitely. Um, and then there's a few things we can do once the sheriff is unable to recover the judgment. Uh, come, so we send a writ to the sheriff, comes back unsatisfied. We got now we've got our toolkit. Um, we can do a blanket bank order. Most counties we don't even attempt it in because they won't allow it. Wake County um, generally allows us to do a blanket bank order where you can send to every bank in the state, um, which is one reason we like filing lawsuits in Wake County as opposed to some of the others. Um, some banks never respond. There's some banks that always respond. Uh, so it's really a coin flip. Uh, second, uh, supplemental exam. That's when we're going out um, to wherever the debtor uh, resides, their county. Um, we're going to ask them questions. We're going to require them require them to produce documents um, showing information about their assets. Um, we can forbid the transfer of assets. Uh, again, we, we, when the debtor is evasive, we're worried about that debtor getting rid of property before we can levy on them. So we know, oh, this debtor owns, you know, a boat. Well, we know that if if we're not quick that boat could be gone. So we're going to go get a court order that forbids that debtor from transferring that boat uh, until, so we have time to levy on it, basically. Um, the next thing we do, and this, I actually had success with this not long ago, uh, examination of witnesses. So we can call into court through a court order, basically anybody that might know something about the debtor's assets. Uh, I recently had a individual debtor uh, did not have his spouse on the hook, uh, but we had gone over, gone through this judgment for a little while, a couple of years, and um, I got an order requiring this guy's wife to show up in court and answer questions. Now, this he was not married to this person when the debt was incurred. Um, I would tell you what the, was behind the debt because it was embarrassing for the debtor, but I'm not going to. Um, but when she got ordered into court a day later, the guy called me up and um, wanted to wanted to resolve it. We settled it. Um, so again, some of these tools are not only useful for getting information; they're incredibly useful for getting these debtors to pay attention. Um, and if we harass them enough, a lot of times it'll it's turn not, into payment. It, Jim, it's not. <laughs> That is not harassing. That's the wrong not, word. I did not use that word. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> we get on their nerves. How about that? Um, we're persistent. Right. We're persistent. The other thing you can do, entry on property. We don't think the debtor is telling us the truth about their assets. We get an order saying we can go to their property. We can look at what they've got. We can take pictures. We can write down what they've got. We can say what we want. We'll tell the sheriff, go seize this, that, 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 and that. Um, I don't know any debtor that wants me on their property. So if I feel like if I get that order, uh, I might get I might get that debtor to to uh, pony up. Finally, if all else fails, we can't even find the debtor. We want to know what the debtor is doing. Um, what kind of activities are they up to? Um, if it's case, if the case matters enough, if the money is big enough, some private investigators out there looking for the debtor, looking for the assets, um, and see what comes of it. And you know, you bring up a good point about you're trying to figure out where they are. And sometimes our clients um, know, their salespeople know, or somehow another, the people within their company know more about what that person is doing in the industry than we do. I mean, we're basing off what information we can get publicly, or if we see them, or if we, but a lot of times they see them in the marketplace. And so sometimes our clients are really helpful to tell us, hey, look, so and so just got a new truck, uh, or he's talking about getting to go on, on a big trip, right? Those can, if we can get that information, that's very helpful. Yep. And James is going to step back in 
Um, and we're just going to talk about some things that y'all can do um, to maybe increase chances of recovery. Um, we've got kind of a list here, but I figured we'd just talk through some things. Um, you know, one of the things I was mostly thinking about was paying attention to the checks you receive from debtors. I mean, how many times have we seen where the beginning of a relationship, you get checks from one entity or one individual? And as that goes on over the years, you start getting checks from companies you've never heard of that are paying that account. Um, and so that information can turn out to be helpful. And if, if that happens, and if your company keeps copies of checks, when you send us the information, if you could send that to us, that is amazingly helpful, especially if we have to do a bank order. Um, it just helps us know, not only if you say, well, the account's closed, it may be, but they still may be banking at the same bank, possibly. Yeah, and it also show, could lead to, well, maybe those entities are really one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So communication is important. The longer you can keep up communication with the debtor, the better. Um, any kind of random bits of information, you never know what could lead to something that helps you recover in a particular case. Yeah, and then a lot of times, like I say, people, um, I, we, a lot of times we'll have clients call us and go, I haven't talked to them, but so-and-so I know through the industry found out that this person you know, is selling their stuff and leaving, right? Need to know that. Uh, or they've just bought a new boat or bought a new truck, or they, you know, they're just bragging about how much money they're making, right? We need to hear those kinds of things. Sometimes we hear it from clients and then sometimes we don't, uh, unless we call up and ask. But if you get that information, if you could update us, I mean, that helps us tell the deputies. And a lot of times the deputies get up tight when they realize people are sort of ignoring them and uh, taking advantage of not paying like they're supposed to. Absolutely. So, is that it? That's all of our slides, but if y'all got questions, I think we can we can still handle some. Absolutely. So again, if y'all have questions, let us know. We'll be glad to help answer those. You can email us, call us. Um, I would say you can text us, so you can do that if you've got our cell, num cell numbers. And as you well know, you can get that anywhere on online today. Um, if, if you have not connected up with us uh, online with any of the um, uh, social platforms, we hope you will do that. I'm going to check my phone, Jim, because I think we may have gotten a question real quick. And it, uh, let's see. No, no additional questions so far. So um, if you haven't joined us on our podcast, we really would encourage you to do that. Hopefully that would be helpful to you, uh, something that you hopefully would enjoy. And if you've got topics you want us to cover, please let us know. Thank you so much for letting us participate today with you, and we hope this has been helpful. Thank you, Jim. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon.